Let's bring in our guest to talk about the other big news of the weekend, and that was it was it was kind of a sneaky slow uh, sports weekend because it's the first weekend with like no football since September. I'm not counting the Pro Bowls football. Sorry, I'm not doing that. Um, we had like you know ACC hoops and college hoops. But didn't even feel like there were that many huge college hoops games outside of Duke, UNC. Uh, and and then NHL was on their all-star break. And just there wasn't a ton happening, right? But here to save us, NBA trade news. Kyrie Irvin goes to the Mavs. Here to discuss that. Straight out of the league pass lair. Wherever it is, he's in it. Uh, it is our good friend Brendan Witted. Follow him on Twitter at HU Cosell. You can check out his work at HU Bison Express or BisonExpress.org. Brendan, what's happening, my man? Nothing much, man. You're and you're right. It wasn't much of a like a, a big or a, going into it. It didn't seem like it was going to be a big one, and then the information kind of gets leaked out eventually that Kyrie demands a trade, and then everything goes like just like a little everything. Everything goes a little bit higher uh, as the deadline approaches. Um, I've become even more of a casual NBA fan. I, I, I've become more casual of a sports fan even when I'm not doing sports every day. Uh, so back me up a little bit. Was the was the Kyrie demanding a trade, how big of a surprise was that? I feel like nothing could be a crazy surprise with Kyrie because he tends to surprise us in a number of different ways. But, like, had that fallen off the radar? Because, it, you know, the Nets had had a pretty good season. And, in fact, I was hearing talk of why do we only talk about Kyrie when he does dumb or says stupid things and we never turn around and talk when he's playing really well. And it was kind of that time where I was like, well, we need to talk about him playing pretty well right now. And then all of a sudden he demands a trade. Yeah, well, I, this had, uh, according to reports, had been broached in the off season, which is part of the, what had perhaps motivated KD to request a trade. Remember, that was that feels like a million years yeah, ago, but yeah. KD re- requested one in the off season, and that the reports were that those were linked. That KD was that that Kyrie was looking for an extension, and Nets were kind of wavering, weren't really here for it. And then as the deadline approached, it kind of the the temperature on that particular request went up, and it just appeared very, very obvious that the Nets were going to go do it, which makes sense, right? Like, it's, after everything with last season, you missed, you missed so much of the season uh, with your decision not to, get, not to get vaccinated, and then you get suspended this year. Uh, like, you're not, you're not going to give the, the, the student that got suspended, like, student of the year, right? Like, right. you're not going to reward them with, hey, we're going to give you more money uh, – uh, for longer than anybody else can because this was essentially what it was like this is a financial decision you know i mean like as much as other stuff goes on with Kyrie, this is something that we've seen a lot more frequently in the nba where it's hey i want to get extended you all hold my rights and so if you can't ex- or have decided not to extend me i want to be traded to another team that can then have my rights and extend me for for the four years and the amount of money that i want in a way that i can't get if i just hit free agency um and so the what made it surprising for me was that he wouldn't want to play with his friend on a championship contender. Because if you were really, really interested in getting that extension, if you bring home a title this year or maybe even hit the finals, it's hard for me to think that they're going to blow that team up. Like, that's a very, very difficult thing for me to think, particularly after KD requested that trade. And so his unwillingness to do that is certainly disappointing because you're taking a championship year away from KD. Like, the Nets were I, – I walked into this season offseason thinking – they have the best roster on in the league. And after this trade, it's still a very good roster. They pick up uh, Dorian Finney-Smith. They pick up uh, Spencer Dinwiddie. They got that 2029 20, unprotected first rounder and then a 2027 20, and 2029 20, second rounder. So you still have a good roster even as currently constructed. You're just not a great roster. You're not one of the best rosters in, in the East. You go from what I thought was the best roster in the in the East and the best chance of, of coming out of the Eastern Conference. You go from first to you're behind the Celtics. You're behind – you're probably behind Philadelphia. Um, I just I, I just don't – I don't you're, – you're no longer a dynamic team. You no longer, to me, are a championship caliber team. Your ceiling has, has, has just decreased. Let's look at the team where he did land. The Mavs are in uh, sixth place – but only two games out of third place. There are a couple teams ahead of them that uh, aren't – I'm not going to diss them, and I'm not following them closely, but they don't have a lot of proven uh, playoff-ness. The Kings are in third, Clippers are in fourth, Grizzlies and Nuggets we've seen be good but not do great in the playoffs. They're ahead of them. Do the Mavs 
uh, I, I didn't look at the Vegas odds to see what happened to him. But hey, do you think to, uh, Kyrie and uh, and Luca playing together works? And does this make wh- where does this put the Mavs in fa- as far as the West? Do they make you, uh, does it make them the most talented roster in the West to you? I don't know about most talented Denver still when they when they put all those pieces together. That's Voltron, man. Yeah. Like they're, they're, you know, you got Jokic, Michael Porter Jr. still coming back. Jamal Murray has looked really, really good recently, and Aaron Gordon for them. He's just important defensively as he is offensively. So that team looks really good. But everybody, as you mentioned, has questions. Uh, Bones Highland, they're one of their main reserves, is kind of been chirping about not getting enough time, and so that has to come into this thing. You mentioned. Uh, Memphis, they're just now getting off of a skid. The Pelicans just got off of, uh, of a 10-game skid, in, in large part due to uh, their injuries and stuff. So, yeah, the West is wide open. Steph Curry looks like he's going to be down for several weeks now with a, with a leg injury. So the West, to me, is is, is far more open than, than the East where you have, you know, Philadelphia, Boston, Milwaukee. Like, those are the now the, the, the cream of, of, of that conference's top. You, you mentioned them playing alongside together in, in terms of Luka and Kyrie. And at first, it seems like they really shouldn't be able to do that uh, because they are such ball dominant guys. But you also do do have to like look at the history of those guys. Now, Jalen Brunson won't have the ball in his hands as much as I assume Kyrie will. But they were really, really good with Brunson after the Western Conference Finals with Brunson as their as their second guy. And he is now you have upgraded in that regard with Kyrie. He's a, he's just a he's just a better all around scorer. Um, even though Brunson's been a little bit better as a playmaker, Kyrie can obviously do that as well. And then you look at Kyrie's history. I mean, playing alongside LeBron and gets a championship. So obviously he's comfortable with playing that kind of second fiddle role. There is there isn't necessarily going to, you know, I, I don't know how much I ever believe in like, oh, well, there has to be a Batman and Robin. I kind of think that's a reductive conversation. They're probably gonna be they're probably gonna have to figure out how to play with one another. Yeah. And and, you know, from the reports that I'm reading, they, they might the Dallas might not be done moving pieces, right? Like uh, according to reports, Christian Wood might be available. Their 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 recent pickup, who's played well for them, and I'm a little surprised to see that that they uh, that they at least that there are reports of them moving on. Uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. has been rumored for a while with a couple of teams, most specifically with the Cleveland Cavaliers. So they might still be in the process of moving this whole thing out. They but as you mentioned, the West is open enough so that if you have Luka and Kyrie, you have to think at least for right now, because you never know what Kyrie is going to do in the future. Right now, you have to think we have as good a shot as any uh, of, of representing the conference. Do you, th- you think we could see two? We've had tons of huge individual scoring games. Um, I was re- listening to some podcasts about it, about how guys have just figured out, it's especially in the regular season, um, heavy usage for guys who are highly you know, efficient and good shooters. It's just good ball. Maybe not for the playoffs where coaches can scheme better for that type of stuff and they're more inclined to in a, you know, a series. But you think there's any chance we could have – has the NBA ever had two guys on the same team score 50 in a game? Because I want them to go for that. I want I want them I want them to beat somebody like I mean and and there's scoring is I think up in the NBA in general so you could have yeah, 100 it you could, it, you know it wouldn't have to be ridiculous where two guys score 50 and the rest of the team only scores two points right like you could have 50 it's, cause, 50, it's certainly conceivable I that's mean, certainly a conceivable I would love to see how it do I need classic. I need like a, a final game where nothing could happen in the standings and they're like Let's just let's just come out here and start firing. Like you, see if we can get you thirty in the first quarter. I'll try and get thirty in the second quarter, and then we'll see what we do in the second half. I want to see fifty. Well, I think if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I think in either Game Six or yeah, I think it was Game Six uh, of the finals. I think Kyrie uh, and LeBron went for like forty. I think I think I think I have that right. Like they both went for something ballistic like that. And yeah, you mentioned scoring is up, and the Mavericks have the sort of offense where that could legitimately happen to put up those kind of 2K numbers where it's just like, yeah, it's back and forth. You go, no, I go, no, you go. Like, I am I think I'm more interested in see what they surround those two guys with because you have to surround them with shooting. You need the defense to work because defensively both have had their struggles yep. on that side of the ball. So I'm very, very – and, and you just you just shift away your best defender. Like, for those that are not familiar with Dorothy Smith, he's a great 3 and D guy. Like, he's your quintessential guy that can guard multiple positions – defensively is strong enough to guard even some of the guys in the post and then is a spacer in terms of hey he can catch and and knock down those catch and shoot jumpers which will be open on drive and kick scenarios with Luka and Kyrie I'm just now interested oh, what who he will be on the net so those will be uh pieces that that what KD will play with but I'm really really interested to in see what they surround Kyrie and Luka with because they they don't seem to be done kind of rebuilding that roster 
Um, I don't enjoy doing it when they're so bad, but we were supposed to talk about the Hornets because they're uh, in the state too. Uh, do you see any tra- – the trade deadline comes up this week, right? Thursday, I believe. Um, uh, there's talk of – like it's so bad for the Hornets where it's like the only time – they don't get, even get brought up in like interesting trades. They're like, well – the, to move this, these good teams that are moving teams around, they might need a third team. And then it's like, oh, the Hornets will be the third team. You can park some dudes and some salary with us. And that's like the most depressing place to be as a fan. Like, we can't even get good trade rumors. We're just like dirt trade rumors. Uh, do you see any, anything happening with the Hornets this week? And if not, uh, like, what, do we, what even are we doing with the Hornets? I'm certainly hoping that we see something. Uh, just a quick shout out. Uh, I'm actually site editor over at Swarm and Sting on the fan side of Umbrella, so you can catch all all that stuff. I'll be editing and writing, and, and you can catch me over there as well. Um, the the thing about the Hornets is that you mentioned it. We are we have been brought into conversations about being the third team in a in a in a trade because hey, let's take on some of these bad contracts and stuff. What what we're what the hope is, and and for Hornets fans is we'll be able to trade some of these pieces that will also free up some some playing time for some of the younger players and figure out what you have in Kai Jones and Book Knight and Thor's finally getting some time late, late in games. Uh, but guys like Plumlee have been on a lot of teams' radar. The Kings have been uh, uh, rumored to be interested. Oubre is another guy because he's having, I think he's having the most points per game of his career. He's had kind of a resurgence. Heard it, had, a, had a really untimely hand injury to a shooting hand. Uh, and he's been sidelined, so he hasn't, you know, he, his name kind of got died down in terms of the trade stuff. Terry Rozier's contract is not great. He's got three more years, even though he's a phenomenal one-on-one player and can play some of your some of your league guard minutes for those second units uh, for for a really good team that needs just a little bit of a boost in terms of their in terms of bench. He would be somebody you look at, and obviously Gordon Hayward, a ton of injuries, but when he is when he's healthy and when he's right. He, he'll give you 17, 18, 7 and 7, something around there on really, really efficient stuff. And it's solid defensively. It's just his his injury history, I think, would drive down any sort of a any sort of a trade for him. But yeah, like getting off of bad contracts, getting some uh, some financial uh, flexibility moving forward, or picking up future assets in terms of draft picks, or a young player that has that hasn't quite gotten their point. You can pair them with Lamelo moving forward. All that stuff is for Hornets fans, right? And then obviously you have the the, the the draft looming in terms of uh, uh, Wimby and and Scoop. Let's go. The top two. Let's those go. two top. Th- that's what everybody wants, right? Like those are for the teams that are so interested in the race to the bottom. That's the conversation. And so I, I know some people don't like the idea of rooting to lose, but I'm not even going to front on you. I certainly am because I want a franchise altering player that can then we can be in conversations about picking up real talent and stuff like that and not being afterthought. Give me all the ping pong balls. Uh, yes, the uh, <laughs> get, being the third team in a trade is like uh, like your crush calling you up and be like, "Hey, you want to go out on a date?" And, the, and you're like, "Oh my god, yes!" And they're like, "Great, I need you to drive for me." And I'm, I'm <laughs> I, like, "I'm going out with somebody else, and we want you to drive." Like that's that's where the Hornets are. Yo, the right, team, like, right, you, hey, you, you're I, on the date technically. I, you were involved <laughs> in the trade, but like you are not uh, not the way you want to be. Well, see, now I got to ask Hayes. I don't know if this ever happened to you. I definitely because the the kids nowadays will never notice um, having to call a girl, but it was a little bit late, so you had to get another, usually a girl on three way, so that they could call. Sure. And so that when the parents answered, it's a it's, it's a, a girl. It's a, it's a girl's voice picking up, and then you slide in there the, on on the three way, like oh, okay, That's all right, right. All right. Yeah. just just gotta you gotta beat the. You gotta beat the gotta beat the man to man pressure and then and then hit me up in the front. But I'm saying, but yeah. that girl that you were calling to message, she was like, "Oh yes, Brendan's calling." Hell yeah! And then, and then you're like, "No, no, no, I just need you to call the other girl." You're like, "Oh man, I'm the Hornets." Oh darn! <laughs> Could you have the car for me, please? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Brendan Witted, check out his work, BisonExpress.org, and Swarm and Sting. Uh, yep. My bad, not getting that in the bio. I will add that for future reference. Um, follow him on sure. Twitter at hu cosell and check out his work. Uh, all the great stuff he does. Some really cool interviews with Howard Athletics. Um, and then over on Swarm and Sting, all things Hornets. Um, appreciate the time, man. As always, great to talk to you. Talk to you too, man. Hey, you're doing a great job, bro. Thanks so. Thank, thanks so. I didn't there. I just fumbled the <laughs> ending there. Uh, it's.